The health and social care sectors are facing a difficult winter. Cases are stacked up into the millions. Covid isn't beaten. And now there's the awkward issue of whether care workers should be compelled to, uh, to have the jab as a condition of employment. And then there's the cut to universal credit. At the centre of many of these tricky issues are low-paid workers, represented by Britain's biggest uni union, Unison. Their General Secretary, Christine McInear, is here, and she joins me. Thank you very much I, for getting into the seat so quickly. Um, the, 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 the conference is, of course, going to be talking a lot about this weekend's issues. But I, I want to, um, besides welcoming you to Sky News, I think it's the first time you've been on the, this programme, uh, I, I, I want to start with the issue that is bread and butter for you. Um, there are 40,000 workers, we think, probably in the health and social care sector who have not been vaccinated. The government, uh, or are yet to be vaccinated, the government says that if people aren't vaccinated by November, they could lose their job. What's the union's position on the government's decision that vaccination should be a condition of employment? Uh, we think it's wrong. I think it's the wrong thing to do. And uh, when we've been speaking to our members who work in social care, and we're the biggest social care union, um, the vast majority of them, the majority of them are, are vaccinated. And we've, we've done everything we can as, as Unison to say to them, get vaccinated. These are the reasons why you should be vaccinated. And I think peer pressure can be a good way in people giving them reassurance about what happened when they got vaccinated. Uh, I think going down the compulsion route, is just uh, counterproductive and people who have genuinely got either conditions or concerns about why they can't be vaccinated or don't want to be vaccinated at this point given where we are in the pandemic they'll just leave they'll leave they'll, they'll you know they'll walk they'll walk away from the job and we're not unique in saying this so we're actually it's the government that's out of step here we're actually you know saying the same thing as most of the providers are saying uh, and so we've said to the government, why are you doing it this way? There must be other things we can do. The sector's already in total crisis. It was in crisis before the pandemic, which just made it even then. The pandemic made it so much worse. Uh, you know, there's over, what, about 120,000 vacancies at the moment. Uh, it's just it's well, well, there'll be more unbelievable. Well, there'll be more vacancies now, presumably, if people uh, decide that they would rather not work than have the jab and this is at the beginning of the winter yeah. now um what is it that could be done about this so what we've said to the government is do more persuasion and actually find out why people aren't getting vaccinated now there may be some reasons why certain people refuse to get vaccinated there is still nervousness among groups and you've got to give them full information about why what happens when you get vaccinated and why it's a good thing to be vaccinated there are some kind of basic um issues that you could deal with as well. So many of them, as you know, Trevor, are low paid workers. Uh, many of them are, don't get paid sick pay when they're off sick, even with COVID related illnesses. And they're worried that if they go and get a jab and they're unwell for a few days or even a week, they're off sick, they get no pay. Uh, so that's one issue. I'm not saying it's the major yeah. issue, but it's certainly one issue. Making it easier for people to get the jab, um, actually bringing them along with groups with other workers to say this is what happened when I got vaccinated this is what it, this is what happened to me this is why it's important there's lots of persuasion you could do rather than coercion so but of course right now there are tens of thousands who haven't even had the first jab and unless the gap between first and second jabs is dramatically reduced they won't be in a, in a position by the November deadline yep. if that happens um, is that going to be a call for industrial action? I mean, how are you going to resolve this? So we are looking at we're looking at legal it? we're looking at legal advice um, and what we can do to support our members. We've got lots of advice out there. We've been contacting them directly. What we're saying, uh, and we're talking to employers as well, saying, let's see if we can find a way through this. Is there something else we can do? Are there some other jobs they can be put in uh, in the meantime while we still try and persuade people to get this done? that actually sacking people is not a good idea because it may be that once people have thought about it a bit more, they will come back. But as you say, if they can't hit that, that deadline, then that's it, they're out. Uh, and so we're trying to say to them and to the government, let's be a bit more flexible about this. And I think there's a terrible irony here and the government are well aware of it, which is every time I've asked them, 
can we do something about low pay? Can we do something about improving standards and training for them? They say, can't do it, Christina. We have no levers because it's, you know, it's all pri mainly private and voluntary sector. The government can use levers when they want to do it because they're clearly doing it for this. OK, so we've got COVID. We've got uh, the 20%, uh, 20 pound a week cut in universal credit, which affects a lot, a lot of your members. Um, you said that you think that this could be the year for industrial action. Um, now, back in 1979, it was your union, or the prede predecessor of Unison, that essentially led that winter of discontent. Are we heading for another winter of discontent? Well, there's certainly a lot of discontent out there, um, but whether it will turn into full-scale industrial action, I don't know. That will be for, the, for our members to, to determine. We are out for consultation at the moment. We've just been consulting on the, the NHS pay Consultation on, a, on, a, on industrial action? Well, a, an indicative ballot, it's called. Um, yeah. So it's not a formal industrial action ballot. Uh, which, as you know, is very restrictive because of the legislation that we've got. Um, so we are, but we're consulting across loads of sectors. So our uh, local government sector, health sector, our police staff members, uh, all being consulted on what they think about the offer or lack of an offer that they've been that they've been given. Um, where will it lead? I don't know yet at this point in time. For example, in the NHS. Uh, there are 16 trade unions and I used to be the lead negotiator for those unions so I know how difficult it is to get consensus across them but that's the aim is to actually talk to the other unions in each of the sectors where we're the main union and see how far we can go down the road of getting some consensus for a, a plan of action shall we say going forward. You are um, I think probably the first woman leader of Unison, if yeah. I'm not mistaken. 75% uh, of your members are women. That reflects a, a wider trend in the trade union movement, which is now uh, has more women members and leader of the TUC is a woman and so on. Do you think that is going to lead to a change in the tactics or, and indeed the preoccupations, the agenda of the trade union movement? I think it will present a different image of the trade union movement without a doubt, as in I think uh, people will see us perhaps differently than, you know, and I'm not saying all, then, all, then, all leaders were the kind of tub-thumping type of, of uh, traditional image of a, of a trade union leader. I mean, by, by no means are, are, are the male trade union leaders all like that. But but, but, sorry to interrupt <laughs> you, but it's very interesting. The, uh, I think probably the best-selling novel of the, the, the year, uh, Richard Osman's The Thursday Murder Club, yeah, has... You've read it, yeah. and it has a guy in it who is a retired <laughs> trade union leader who is probably a mix of, I don't know, Ron Todd and uh, the, the, the old TNG uh, yeah. leader. Um, do you think that those days are over for that guy? Uh yeah, I mean, I think especially because of the membership, I mean, and it varies across unions. I mean, I just look at my own union. In Unison, as you say, 75% women. A big percentage of ours do jobs like care workers or their nurses or their health care assistants or, uh, you know, they, they, their uh, c control room staff within police and, and uh, uh, ambulance centres. You know, there's a huge range of jobs, cleaners, caterers, etc. And I don't mean they're not militant. I don't mean they're not um, passionate about uh, their rights. But I think they have a different way of expressing it, in a sense. And so that old image of you know a male, of a, you know a man in a in a donkey jacket or a high vis vest standing around a brazier. I mean, uh, uh, that's not where our members are. Our members will take strike action. Our members will pick it. They will do. They will uh, you know stand and demonstrate against unfairness and injustice. But I think they expect the leaders to be able to uh, negotiate, to talk sensibly on the, and express arguments on their behalf. And at the end of the day, they pay us as the officials to get deals. That's what my members ask me to do. So megaphones out, out, out. Thank you, Christy <laughs> McInerney.